Co-Stars by Charles McMurdy When the changing pictures on the big screen got around again to the scene where Colliston gets the telegram from his father, young Jones gathered up his cap and coat, and with a pardon me, shuffled sideways in front of the row of rapt spectators, who, their gaze still fastened on the screen, half rose to let him pass. As he walked up the dark aisle past the long rows of absorbed humanity, Jones unconsciously threw out his chest and hardened the muscles just under his shoulder blades. He would bet he could put up as good a fight as William Farnham, he thought to himself. What a great thing it was to be a strong man, a man who could step coolly in a moment's notice and dominate the scene, a strong, calm, resourceful man who could hand a good punch to anyone who tried to put it over him. A real man, ready at the drop of the hat to fight like a wildcat to protect and defend the weak, the defenseless, especially some sweet, beautiful young girl. It had been a great picture, and he felt the thrills running up and down his spinal cord as Farnham had smashed the ranch foreman in the face and then proceeded to mix it with him. Yes, it was a great thing to be a man like that. He was glad he was athletic in build. He hardened his muscles again as he strode with swinging step down the long corridor, past the pictures of all the big stars. At the sidewalk, he stopped a moment to glance at his own reflection in the big mirror. He pulled his cap half an inch more over his right eye and grinned broadly at himself. He had never noticed it before, but in that cap he looked something like Farnham, only younger and slighter. He caught the girl in the ticket booth watching him and hurried out. On the sidewalk, his glow of satisfaction was suddenly interrupted by the realization that he was hungry. Dinner at the boarding house had been somewhat light. Across the street, the name of a famous restaurateur shone on an enormous white script across a broad window. A plate of wheats and coffee would go just right, thought Jones. He dodged across the street between the automobiles and streetcars and entered the brilliant and immaculate restaurant. There were only a few persons in the big, white-tiled room, and the long rows of chairs with their broad table arms were almost deserted. Halfway up the room, a young girl was sitting. A cup of coffee and a roll on a plate adorned the arm of her chair, and part of another roll was poised in one small, white hand. Pretty, thought Jones. Somehow she looked so lonely, so out of place in the big, glistening room. Some girl who had just got through her evening's work in one of the big stores, probably. Plate of wheats, said Jones. Plate of wheats, cried the board waiter in stentorian tones. Plate of wheats, came the echo from the kitchen. When they were handed out, Jones carried them carefully over to a chair near the girl and proceeded to watch her out of the corner of his eye as he ate. She interested him. He felt a vague desire to befriend her, to sympathize with her, to protect her from the hardships of life in the big city. An heroic glow of conscious manhood warmed him, and again he hardened the muscles of his chest and shoulders. And yet, what was the use of having a splendid physique, unless you were a moving picture actor? There was no romance in this prosaic, humdrum, everyday life. On the screen, everything was big and fine and brave and splendid, but nothing ever happened to him. He set his mug of coffee down in bitter disgust. Three rough-looking youths burst through the revolving door with noisy merriment and came up the long room toward the counter. The one in advance spied the lone girl and immediately assumed an exaggerated and comic swagger for the amusement of his companions. "'Ah, gee!' he exclaimed loudly. "'Just watch me, kiddo!' He leered at the girl as he walked past her and his two companions guffawed. The girl looked down timidly at her plate. Joan's blood boiled. All the vague heroic impulses that had been smoldering within him leaped into sudden flame. Here was a chance for action, a chance to do something. Here was the opportunity he had waited for. The three toughs, after much noisy jest and argument with the man at the counter, carried their coffee and rolls over to three chairs directly opposite the young girl and settled themselves down to a systematic campaign of low comedy for her benefit. Jones sat in his chair, every nerve tingling. His hand trembled so that he could hardly set his mug of coffee down. Then one of the youths, the one who had swaggered in first, flipped a lump of sugar across the aisle to land at the girl's feet. His companions roared. Jones arose. The vision of William Farnham smashing his trusty left into the ranch foreman's face was in his mind as he stepped over in front of the three youths. Say, just can the comedy, will you? 
he said, unconsciously dropping into the vernacular of the street. His voice trembled with anger and excitement. Cut out the rough stuff. This is a place for ladies and gentlemen. You're not in any bar room now. The comedian of the trio arose. Say, Bo, what's eaten you? He demanded, with an easy roll of profanity. Get on over there and sit down, you white-livered dude, or I'll push your face in for you. He pushed his own face to within three inches of Jones's nose. It was Jones' cue for action. There was only one thing to do, and Jones did it. One thought of William Farnham flashed across his mind as he shot his left straight into the tough's leering face, turning his own head and guarding his face with his right, as Olson, the boxing instructor at the YMCA, had taught him to do. At the same moment, something hit him a sickening blow over his solar plexus, and something else struck him on his right ear, jarring his whole head horribly. Then the lights on the ceiling began to whirl around and suddenly went out altogether. After a long time, all night, it seemed, Jones heard a far-off voice say, He's coming out of it now. He'll be all right. He wondered vaguely whom they were talking about. The voice was not one that he knew, and it seemed a long way off. He opened his eyes and looked up at a snowy white ceiling, studded with millions of electric lights. A man he never saw was bending over him, and cold water was trickling down his neck from a wet napkin on his forehead. "'Feel better now?' asked the man. "'Oh, yes, it was the cashier. He remembered it all now.' "'Them young rummies did you up,' continued the man. "'What else could you expect, three against one? You shouldn't have tackled them. "'Did they get away?' asked Jones faintly. Sure, answered the cashier. They was out of here before I could get hands on them. Jumped their checks, too. You ain't got no show against them fellas. They wandered up here from the east side. Guess you're all right now. I'm awfully sorry it happened. Then, for the first time, Jones became conscious that the hand which was so gently bathing his forehead and trickling cold water down his neck was not the cashier's. It was a very small, white hand, and Jones sat up to confront the girl he had championed. She was kneeling beside him, and she suddenly became very much embarrassed. "'I want to thank you,' she said haltingly. "'It was awfully kind of you to take my part.' "'Thank me,' said Jones thickly. His upper lip felt like a balloon. "'For what? For getting licked?' "'Don't you say that,' exclaimed the girl, forgetting her embarrassment. "'Anybody get licked, fighting three men at once. "'And toughs like that, too?' You did just splendidly. So did they, said Jones, with a swollen smile. He got onto his feet and sat down in one of the big arm chairs, and the girl seated herself in the one next to him. The cashier appeared with two mugs of coffee. Have another cup on the house, he said. I guess yours got cold. And if there's anything else you'd like, say the word. You know, I'd just been over to see Mary Pickford at the Empire, said the girl, as the hospitable cashier departed. And say, the way you smashed that fellow in the jaw just reminded me of the way her leading man knocks down the villain in one scene. It was just grand. Jones hardened the muscles of his chest, back, and shoulders. They were somewhat sore, but... You know, it seems an awful thing to say. I'm so sorry about your ear, but I'm really glad it happened, went on the girl. You know, I was just thinking, as I sat there, that nothing really exciting or romantic ever happens to me, and I was just sort of wishing that somebody would rescue me from something awful, and there'd be an awful fight and all that. She laughed, embarrassed at her candor. Did you ever feel that way? Thrills of real romance chased up and down Joan's spinal column as he answered. Never till I saw you. No mug of coffee ever hid so charming a blush. As they stepped out into the cool evening air, Jones tucked the girl's hand under his left arm, where it nestled snugly. "'Up this way,' she said. "'Mama will be so glad to meet you when I tell her what you did.' For a moment they stood silent. The clanging of the streetcars, the long procession of automobiles speeding up the avenue, the laughing crowds hurrying past the brilliant store windows, all seem imbued with a new and lively interest. It seemed to Jones as if he had always known her that she was the girl he had been looking for all his life, that he had only just found her now. She tightened her clasp on his arm as he looked down at her. I guess all the things that are fine and brave and noble and exciting don't have to happen in plays, do they? She said. I guess we had a perfectly good adventure of our own, just as exciting as any Mary Pickford ever acted in. 
or William Farnham, answered Jones, and from across the street the big flashing sign of the Strand shed a red and golden radiance over them as they walked up the avenue together. End of section number 13